So I had the plant molecular biology lab at the IGC, the Instituto Gulbenkian Ciencia, which I guess nobody here has been, but it's a pretty amazing place to work at. It's off the coast, um, near, very near Lisbon. It's a very small um, environment, about 40, but very small groups. We have actually a limit of people in our groups. And they work on very different topics from cell and developmental biology to evolution and immunobiology. And the scientific atmosphere is just fantastic. So if you haven't yet, I really recommend the visit. Um, our lab has grown significantly in the past year or two. Besides me, it is currently composed of five postdocs and three PhD students, all very talented people and great to interact with from the most various um, uh, nationalities. When Rui decided to join for a PhD about two months ago, I was really happy because now I have someone to speak Portuguese to in the lab. I didn't have until now, and I really missed that. So what do we do? To put it very, very broadly, we use Arabidopsis. Is everybody familiar with Arabidopsis taviana? No. So Arabidopsis is a weed, has no economic importance whatsoever. It's uh, pretty insignificant and it has no commercial use whatsoever or agricultural, but it grows very fast. It makes, it has like um, two to three month life cycle, so you can get the next generation, plus it has a selfing nature. So with one plant, you can actually get 10,000 seeds of the next generation in two and a half months. Uh, for, mute, for doing genetics, this is great because you get one seed of a mutant and you can propagate it very easily, selfing, no problems without breeding and so on. It, um, it has very compact genome, the same amount of genes more or less we have, 25, but very compacted. And the, I think the thing that makes it uh, the preferred model of plant biologists is the fact that it is um, very easily transformable. So all we do is actually get agrobacteria, which is a specific type of bacterium that infects the roots of plants. We have plants more or less at that stage starting to flower. We have our plasmid of interest that we want to introduce this gene into the plant. All we do is dip the flowers for two seconds in this soup of bacteria, wait for the plant to grow and give seed, and we are sure to have like 5% of the seeds transformed with our gene of interest. So that is pretty cool. So basically, to put it in a very, very broad uh, sense, we, we use Arabidopsis as a model system to try and understand how plants perceive and respond to environmental signals at the molecular level. And more specifically, we are interested in two major uh, lines of work. While most of the lab studies alternative splicing, we also have a couple of people that are interested in understanding the functions of a particular class of membrane transporters called the major facilitator superfamily, also known as the MFS. So by far the two largest groups of membrane transporters on Earth are the ABCs and the MFS. ABCs hydrolyze ATP for their activity and are in general multiple component transporters. While MFSs are always single polypeptide carriers that use electrochemical gradients as energy source. So they piggyback on, for instance, PhD, pH, sorry, pH gradients to transport solids across membranes. Okay, so in addition to being the most abundant, these are also the only two groups of transporters known to occur in all classes of living organisms. And while all of you probably have heard of ABCs because there have been intensively studies. The MFS are very poorly understood. And what our group has been doing in recent years is to use reverse genetics to try and understand the biological functions of these transporters in plants. And we have uh, been able to uh, characterize a few of them, such as two plasma membrane phosphate transporters that while not required for the plant under normal conditions, when the plant is under phosphate starvation, they become essential because they are high affinity transporters that can uptake the very little inorganic phosphate in the soil. 
We have also characterized ZIFL13, which is a plasma membrane transporter that is in stomatal cells and regulates the aperture of these pores and thereby regulates water loss and then the response to drought in plants. We have also shown the functions of ZIF2, which is localized in the vacuolar membrane of root cells and regulates the response to zinc toxicity. Is that me? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, ZIF2 regulates the response of the plants to iron toxicity, to more specifically zinc. We also found another root transporter that mediates the um, potassium and cesium homeostasis in Arabidopsis. And more recently, we found that two MFS transporters from yeast confer tolerance to a wide range of toxic compounds when heterologously expressed in Arabidopsis plants. So together, these studies have um, revealed a prominent role for MFS transporters in plants tolerance to abiotic stress conditions, but as you will see soon, they have also been very important in our other main focus of the lab, which is um, mRNA splicing, which as everybody here knows, even those that don't work on splicing, is the removal of the non-coding introns from the precursor mRNA molecules to form mature transcripts that then can be exported to the cytoplasm for translation by the ribosome. <laughs> And the splicing process depends on the action of a large, one of the largest molecular machines in the cell called the spliceosome, which is composed of five SNRPs. SNRP stands for small nuclear ribonuclear particles. Each of these SNRPs is composed of one small RNA molecule and several proteins that assemble on the pre-mRNA together with a wide um, group of other accessory proteins to form the spliceosome, and upon a series of conformational changes that I'm not depicting here, execute the excision of the intron, which is released in the form of a lariat and rapidly degraded, and the spliceosome then disassembles with the SNRPs being recycled for assembly in other introns. Okay? So, but all the spliceosome does actually is to bring together the splice sites for the splicing reaction to occur. The splicing reaction requires no energy, no energy input. So, a lot of ATP is consumed during splicing, but only in the assembly and operation of the spliceosome. Splicing itself is a simple and spontaneous two-step transesterification reaction. In the first step, you have a nucleophilic attack of the 2 prime OH of what is called the branch site to the phosphoryl group of the G in the 5 prime splice site, followed by a second reaction with a nucleophilic attack of the 3 prime OH to the phosphoryl group of the 3 prime splice site G. Okay, so but what we study specifically in our lab is alternative splicing, which occurs when splice sites are differentially recognized and the same pre-mRNA molecule ends up being spliced in more than one different way, giving rise to more than one transcript and potentially more than one protein from the same gene. This can happen in a variety of different ways, such as in the exome skipping event I just showed you, but there are also cases where uh, alternative three prime or five prime splice sites are selected, giving rise to different exomes of different length. There are also cases of mutually exclusive exomes where either one or another exome are included in the final transcript or particularly abundant in plants are cases where specific introns are retained. And so why is this important? Of course, alternative splicing is a potent generator of proteomic diversity. It greatly expands the coding capacity of genomes. And it has been shown to influence virtually all aspects of protein function, from binding proteins to properties to subcellular localization, stability of proteins and their post-translation modification and so on. But alternative splicing can also be an important means of regulating gene expression by, for instance, splicing uh, differently regions of the transcript that are important for its stability 
or more frequently by changing the frame and introducing premature stop codons that then target these transcripts for degradation by a process called nonsense mediated decay or NMD. Okay, so the splicing uh, process, as I said before, depends on the recognition of specific intronic sequences called splice sites in more than 99% of the cases an intron starts with a GU and ends with an AG. The rest of the five prime and the three prime splice sites are pretty variable. And basically only an A defines the branch site. And these splice sites are recognized by the core components of the spliceosome, the SNRPs, usually via base pairing of their small RNA component. Okay? But because these sequences are short and degenerate, they're usually not sufficient to drive the assembly of a functional spliceosome. There are other cis elements in the pre-mRNA, such as exonic or intronic splicing enhancers, that are recognized by accessory uh, spliceosomal proteins, such as SR proteins, which interact with the RNA, sorry, which recognize and bind the RNA and interact with core splicing, splicing machinery components recruiting them to the nearby splice site. So basically, the strength of a splice site depends not only on its consensus sequence, but on the concentration and the combination of splicing factors that are present in the cell at that given moment. Okay, so SR proteins are spliceosomal proteins, but not core components of the spliceosome, so they're non snrp proteins, which are heavily phosphorylated. Um, by definition, they are composed by one or two N-terminal RNA recognition motifs and one um, RS uh, domain, which is reversibly phosphorylated and is important, as I said before, for protein-protein interactions. So in plants, and here I want to just um, make uh, one thing very clear. When I asked uh, Emanuele what he really wanted me to focus on my talk, he said one thing I could stress would be the differences from splicing, the splicing process in plants. And I told him that's pretty complicated because there are very few differences. So the splicing process, like actually basically every fundamental cellular process is conserved in plant cells. Transcription, translation, splicing, all happens. NMD, everything happens basically the same way. There are a few differences that I could say. So exons are slightly larger in plants. Introns are much, much smaller than in mammalian cells. And this has led to a difference in the exon definition model. So the model in animals is that exons are recognized as a unit and the splicing machine recognizes them and has protein-protein interactions across the exon. In plants, this is thought to happen with introns, which are defined by the splicing machinery and um, recognized as, as a unit. So SR proteins in plants were first identified in the mid-90s using antibodies specific against an epitope in animal SR proteins. And since then, most of the SR proteins, or several of them, I wouldn't say the majority, but several of them, have been shown to play the same functions because they can complement mammalian cell extracts in, in vitro assays. And they can, they're also active in mammalian uh, splicing assays. So as often happens in plants, and this is something you might, might not know, plants have often much larger and more diverse gene families. So this happens in SR proteins too. We only have 12 SR proteins. Arabidopsis has 18, plus another two or three SR-like proteins. There are 24 in rice, and only seven and eight in C. elegans and Drosophila, respectively. Okay, so to summarize what I just told you, these SR proteins play crucial roles in splice site selection. I have shown you before that ESC bound SR proteins stabilize, recruit, and stabilize interactions with uh, core spliceosome components at the three prime and the five prime splice sites. They have also been shown to antagonize the activities of proteins such as HNRMPs, which recognize splicing silencers. And they're important to form a network of protein-protein interactions across introns, bringing together the five and the three prime splice sites early during um, 
uh, splicer cell assembly. This is speaking, what's happening here? Okay. Um, Okay, so because SR proteins are key factors in early assembly of the spliceosome, they are, you know, essential for the first step recognition of splice sites. Because they have been shown to influence the selection of splice sites in a concentration and phosphorylation dependent manner, and because all organisms that are known to undergo alternative splicing have this family of proteins conserved, they are widely recognized as key factors in alternative splicing, okay? Key modulators of alternative splicing. And alternative splicing in animals, as some people in the audience know well, is a highly predominant feature of most eukaryotes. It is known that about 95% of our multi exon genes, those that contain introns, 95% of them generate more than one transcript via this mechanism. And as uh, many people in the audience know better than I do, in mammalian systems and other animals, um, alternative splicing has been shown to be key for many processes. It determines the sex of the fruit flies. It has been shown to be important for the recognition of different sound frequencies in the inner ear. Uh, it has more recently shown to be important for bats to sense hot spots at the surface of the skins of their prey. And of course, as the Burati lab and probably the Valali lab know very well, mutations in splicing factors and splice sites have been associated with numerous uh, serious human diseases, including different types of cancer. So what about in plants? So basically in plants we know now that at least half, many times more in Arabidopsis it's significantly more, of the genomes are being alternatively spliced. And since we're far behind in our RNA-seq and long uh, and wide-scale analysis, I can tell you that I'm sure in a few years the numbers of the 60-something and 70% we have now are going to rise to human levels because we have analyzed much fewer tissues and when we start seeing tissues in different organs of the plant or different situations, we will find many other splice variants. So despite the fact that we know it's highly prevalent in higher plants, we know very little what alternative splicing is important for, okay? So we're coming now to specifically our work. A major goal in our lab is to try and understand why is alternative splicing biologically relevant for plants. Okay? And we are addressing this question in two different ways. First, we try to find individual Arabidopsis genes where alternative splicing has clear meaning, right? Like the case of sex lethal in Drosophila that determines the sex of the fly, and so on. That's one approach. The other way we've been approaching this question is by doing the functional analysis of a class of major regulators of alternative splicing. So to start with our um, first approach, in recent years we have found, we have reported several cases in Arabidopsis where alternative splicing has clear biological impact, such as that of this E3 ligase where skipping of an exon excludes a nuclear localization signal, and this determines dual targeting of two isoforms, one to the nucleus and one to the cytoplasm. And we have found that this has a differential impact on the formation of the apical hook of the plant during early seedling development. This is very important because when the seed is buried in the dark, the primordial stem grows very fast through the soil. And the plant has to do this hook to protect the apical meristem with all the stem cells here. So what we have found is that this alternative splicing has a different impact on regulating the apical hook. And now our membrane transporter work has been a pretty prolific source of alternative splicing um, events with relevance for the plant. So ZIFL1 is an MFS transporter that we showed by heterologous expression in yeast is a potassium transporter. And what happens is that there's an alternative three prime splice site selection event in the 16th exon of the gene, you can see how 
introns are so small in plants, which actually generates two transcripts that differ only in two nucleotides. Okay, there's a, two consecutive AGs, and sometimes it picks up this one, sometimes that one, and we found that we had more or less a 50-50 ratio of two transcripts that were exactly the same length, they only differed in two nucleotides. But because this changed the frame, what happens is that we get uh, a premature stop codon introduced there, and we get a, a seriously truncated uh, splice form, which we thought would be not functional. But it still had the hydrophilic loop through which the substrate passes, and through reverse genetics mainly, using genetics, what we found is that these two splice forms are actually targeted to different membranes in the cell. One is in the vacuole and one is in the plasma membrane. And they're also targeted to different tissues. One goes to the root and one goes to the stomata. And therefore, this determines two very different physiological roles in the plant. So while the truncated form regulates the tolerance to lack of water, it allows the plant to regulate water loss. The other one is involved in the development of the root. In a last example, we found a zinc transporter where high levels of zinc that are detrimental to the growth of the plant actually promote the retention of an intron. But this intron retention event is in the 5' UTR. So this actually generates two protein, two transcripts that code for the exact same protein. And we thought this would not have any impact or any functional relevance for the plant because you have two transcripts that are coding for the same protein. But what we found is that the retention of this intron generates a secondary structure in the pre-mRNA that actually enhances translation of this RNA. So high zinc changes the splicing to increase translation and thereby promote tolerance of the plant to zinc because this zinc transporter actually confers tolerance to the plant to high zinc. Okay? So moving now to our second approach, which was the study of SR proteins, what we have been doing is to use reverse genetics to analyze individual members of the SR protein Arabidopsis family. So if these are indeed major modulator of alternative splicing, if we knock out these things, we should be able to uh, infer from the phenotypes what are the biological roles of splicing. Then we have the problem of identifying those targets, but I'll get there soon. So what we, what we have done so far characterized in depth are only two of these proteins, SR45 and SCL38. And I'm very briefly in four slides each telling you what we have found with these two SR proteins. What we have found is that they regulate indeed the response to external signals, so basically to stressful signals, by regulating uh, the signaling of a very important stress hormone in plants called abscisic acid. So abscisic acid is a fundamental, one of the five classical plant hormones that have already been described by the 60s of the 20th century. And it is important in development, especially in the seed, where it controls the, it promotes the storage of nutrients and of um, the establishment of dormancy. It is also important in other um, developmental stages of the plant. But what ABA is more known for is for its um, mediation of stress responses. So although plants are also known to some extent to have mechanisms that are independent of this hormone, an adequate response to drought and salt stress, but also to temperature stress, relies on the endogenous production, on the accumulation of ABA inside the plant, which then rapidly leads to perhaps the most famous of the responses is the rapid closure of the stomata. And this happens in one or two minutes by regulating um, the fluxes through ion channels in these cells of the stomata. It needs no de novo protein synthesis. But ABA also induces a wide reprogramming of the transcriptome to do several things, mainly uh, the production of osmoprotectants, but also to arrest early growth of the plant. 
So in a way to protect the plant against distress, it arrests uh, germination and early seedling development to wait for more um, favorable conditions for germination. And very briefly, I want to give you uh, a picture of the ABA signaling pathway. So what happens is that you have all these stresses are known to cause osmotic stress to cells, and this osmotic sensor has not yet been identified, but it somehow leads to the endogenous production of ABA. And when ABA is produced, it is recognized by soluble cytoplasmic receptors that bind to phosphatases, inhibiting, repressing their inhibitory activity on key kinases that are essential for transduction of the ABA signal. So when you have high ABA, these things here, these phosphatases are inhibited. This suddenly allows the autophosphorylation of SNRK2s, which are key stress response kinases in plants that lead to the phosphorylation of transcription factors that then um, produce proteins that are hugely important for stress response and early growth arrests. What I want you to retain from here is that this pathway is hugely important in plant biology. It has been extensively studied, and it has been mainly studied or only studied at the transcriptional level and also at the post-transcriptional level because of these phosphorylation events that are key to the signal transduction, okay? So I want you to retain this. And now back to the two SR proteins that we have uh, characterized in depth. We have uh, shown that SR45, while having no problems in normal development, when it's in the presence of external sugar, moderate concentrations which do not inhibit the wild type, the SR45 knockout mutant has its development arrested. This does not happen with equimolar concentrations of mannitol, showing that this is a sugar-specific effect and not an osmotic effect. This inhibition is also seen at the level of the inhibition of hypocotyl elongation in the dark that I told you about, right? The hypocotyl in the dark expands very quickly so it can reach the light at the surface of the soil. And the SR45 mutant is clearly hypersensitive to this sugar inhibition of development, indicating that SR45 is negative regulating sugar signal. And what we show later by a series of experiments, and it does so by um, impairing both the sensitivity and the production of ABA. So this mutant is also hypersensitive to ABA, not only to sugars, and if you prevent the plant of producing ABA in response to the sugar stress, what it does is that it rescues the phenotype, and we also find that the mutant produces much more ABA endogenously in response to sugar, indicating that SF35 is repressing endogenous accumulation of ABA in response to stress. And that's just a minor thing to tell you that we have some mechanistic molecular insight into how this happens. SNRK1 is an energy sensing kinase that coordinates the sugar and the ABA response. And what we found is that specifically under sugar, our mutant contains much more uh, SNRK1 kinase. Uh, and this is also corroborated by markers of the activity of SNRP1 that are overinduced in, uh, under glucose in the mutant. And then we wanted to know if this higher amount of protein were due to higher protein synthesis or to less um, or to reduce degradation of this protein. And we did, you know, in the presence of glucose, we added an inhibitor of protein synthesis or of the proteasome. And this difference was suppressed in the presence of the proteasome inhibitor, indicating that in the wild type, SR45 is promoting the degradation of a kinase that coordinates the ABA and the sugar response. Okay, so bottom line is SR45 uh, responds to sugars via the ABA pathway. My second and last story in four slides, SCL30A is another SR protein, which we also found had, we generated the knockout to know what this SR, for, this SR protein was important for in the plant. And what we had tremendous difficulty in finding a phenotype because the plant seemed fine in every respect, which was actually not that unexpected because with an 18 
uh, protein member, we always thought we would need to do multiple mutants to find phenotypes because of redundancy between them. But then Sophia, who was a PhD student that found this phenotype, said, Paul, I'm sure they have smaller seeds. They look fine, but they have smaller seeds. Indeed, we quantified the area, the seed size of these seeds, and they're 10 to 15 percent smaller. And then we said, Sophia, look, let's look at germination. Maybe they're not so good at germinating, but apart from a very minor effect, they have no problem in germinating. But when we place these seeds under stress, we found a clear phenotype. So the mutant under salt or osmotic stress, mannitol induces high osmotic pressure, so it, induce, it mimics a situation of drought, of lack of water. So under high salinity and drought stress, these seeds could not even germinate half of what the wild type germinate, although under optimal conditions they seem to germinate fine. So SCL30A does not affect, affect the ability of a seed to germinate except if under stress, okay? And then what we did is this is exactly the phenotype I just showed you, no phenotype under controlled conditions, but a huge difficulty in germinating under stress. But if you check the same phenotype in the presence of an inhibitor of ABA, if you don't let the plant produce ABA, the phenotype almost disappears. And this shows that the control that SCL30A is, re is exerting on uh, the stress uh, response during germination is dependent on the, SCL, on the ABA pathway. Okay, so my last slide on SCL30A is just to show you that we immediately thought if the mutant has these phenotypes, maybe we can generate super seeds. And what we did is we did the overexpressor and the overexpressor actually has larger seeds. And yes, they do germinate twice as much under stress than the wild type, okay? So this thing might allow us in crops, not in the Arabidopsis, which is useless, to make uh, crops with bigger seeds that germinate faster under salt and drought stress. Okay, so let me wrap up in two or three slides. What have I shown you regarding our second approach of trying to see why alternative splicing is important by checking the functions of these major modulators of alternative splicing. I have shown you that SR45 negatively regulates sugar signaling during early plant development by repressing the ABA pathway. And on the other hand, SCL30A um, regulates ABA dependent drought and salt stress responses during seed germination. So although the upstream signaling clearly differs because they respond to different external signals, both these SR proteins converge on down-regulating the ABA pathway and thereby controlling seed germination and early development. And this might allow, under moderate stress conditions, germination and plant stress tolerance, okay? So the last... A uh, piece of information I want to leave you uh, with is something we're pretty excited about. So remarkably, not only these two, but in the last few months, and I would say not more than six or six to eight months, we have found that not only these two SR proteins regulate stress responses and specifically those that are mediated by the ABA. Almost every single mutant that we check seems to have no, at least the single mutants. If you do higher order mutants, they start being implicated in other stuff. Almost, not all of them, but 90% of the mutants we have generated have specific ABA phenotypes. And this on one hand, and, uh, on one hand tells us that there is a novel layer of regulation of the ABA pathway, which has been known to be under tight transcriptional and post-transcriptional control, but it has to be, because these things all bind RNA and are supposed to be splicing factors, there has to be a post-transcriptional level of regulation of the stress responses mediated by the ABA hormone. And also, what we're doing now, and we have come quite a few significant steps in this direction, is we feel that alternative splicing may be exerting broad control on flat stress tolerance by 
targeting components of the abuse pathway. We have found this is true for a few of them. But what we need to do is to identify, of course, the mRNA targets of these SR proteins and the binding sequences. And what we have done already for a few is to check both with the mutant and the overexpressor by RNA-seq what are the mRNAs that are under, whose splicing is under control of these SR proteins. And then among these, we want to check which ones um, bind directly, we're starting this work now, bind directly the SR protein in question and exactly which sequences do they target. But most importantly, and this is what I'm finding most difficult, although I have pretty optimistic people in the lab, we will then need to find what are really the functional targets of this. And for this, we will need to see which of these splicing uh, events are able to rescue the stress phenotype when we recover the splicing pattern of the target in the mutant that shows the ABA phenotype. Okay? So that's about it. I just want to thank Vera Nunes, who's crucial for um, the work that the three plant labs at the IGC do. Uh, previous lab members who were key for some of the work I showed, collaborators, funding, which comes mainly from our national uh, funding agency, the FCT, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.